Hello, my name is Melissa Trankman. I'm thrilled to be here today to chat with Leslie Holmes. Please find her complete bio and highlights of her career in the Vocal Point column, appearing in volume 80, issue one of the Journal of Singing. That's the September 2023 issue. So hello, Leslie. It's great to see you today and be with you and get a chance to pick your brain a little bit. Hello, Melissa. It's lovely to be with you. So you've been interviewing artists for the Vocal Point column the past 22 years. Is that correct? Uh, I think so. For oh, 10 or 12 years before that, I did it for the FM Classical Station in Boston. So it's a little hard to remember where one ended and one started. Interesting. So it's been at least 22, but I right. think it's been more like 24. Your list of interviewees is very impressive. And, you know, the conversations you've had with these great artists are really inspiring. Can you pick a favorite interview, perhaps? Oh, that's like asking someone to pick their favorite food. Um, I would say the person with whom I have had the longest post-interview relationship is Dawn Upshaw. She is just so warm and wonderful. I interviewed Marnie Nixon at her apartment one time. That was really nice. She was lovely. Oh, that must have been amazing. I think I learned a lot from all of them or most of them. And I think the biggest thing I learned was that most of them were down to earth, normal people. Yeah. Every once in a while I run up against a diva or a devo, but very rarely. And it makes you realize all over again how important it is to be real when you're up there, not to be performing or entertaining, but be feeling and thinking and communicating. So you feel that maybe their personalities or their down-to-earthness as people was a part of their success as performers? I, yes, I do. It's like, it's kind of a funny comparison, but it's like a newscaster. Hmm. You can tell which newscasters are kind of reading their script looking for more questions, and which newscasters are really listening and being moved by what they hear. And I think a recurring theme throughout interviewing people has been, first of all, to make it a conversation instead of an interview. Mm -hmm. And number two, that the recurring theme was communication. Most of the singers thought that that was the most important thing about performing was communicating, and I do too. And so I really approach all of these people, whether it's Tom Hansen or oh, I'm trying to think, I can't think of the name of the wonderful woman who's very short and who does pop singing as well as opera singing. She can sing an amazing glitter and be gay. Oh, Kristen Chenoweth. Yes. Yeah. And she surprised me in a kind of a different way. And that was, I interviewed her at Symphony Hall in the green room in the back. And she was about to go on to do what turned out to be a two hour concert. And I was told by her manager that the interview would be 15 or 20 minutes. And I thought, well, okay, that's better than nothing. Well, an hour later, she said, I, you know, I really better get ready. But <clears throat> she told her manager, and this will sound like I'm tooting my horn, but I'm not, it's, it's a point because he told me right away, she came, I left and she said to him, sit down, come sit down. That was the best interview I have ever had. And I think it wasn't because I was so great. 
it was because I'm a singer and we talked about the voice as your soul and your inner being. And I don't think anyone had ever broached that kind of a subject with her before. Mm. I, you know, they were more, and I don't mean to sound deprecating, they were more showbiz interviewers. Mm -hmm. And that was a very special conversation because we really, really connected. <clears throat> well, the Journal of Singing audience will have to go look up that interview. Do you remember what issue it was by any chance? Oh, are you kidding? For some reason, I'll not look it too up. long ago, I counted up the number of people I interviewed, and it was something like 65. Wow. So I'm not going <clears> to <throat> remember. So with the interviews that you conducted, did you have an overarching goal for all of them or was it specific to the person that you were interviewing in that moment? It was specific. And I kind of let the interviews or the conversations go in whatever direction they went. Mm. I tried not to guide them. Nice. Because when you do that, you kind of confine people mm -hmm. instead of having them feel free to talk about whatever they want to talk about. So if they want to talk about the dishwasher, you talk about the dishwasher. Because when you're really conversing with someone, I don't think you secretly channel what they're going to say. You let them say what they want to say. Mm -hmm. And then you come in with what you want to say about what they said. Mm. Beautiful. Now, is there someone that you wish that you could have interviewed that you never got the opportunity to interview? Or do you uh, feel like- Yes, Bryn, Bryn Turfel. Hmm. We kept not being where the other one was. And I would have liked to interview him. There were very few people who ever said no. Why do you think that is? Well, as time went on, People wanted to be on that list. Right. It was a, it's an impressive list. But I used to go to New York a lot to interview people. You know, waiting downstairs to talk in a high rise in Manhattan to talk to Morella Franey. You go, I mean, you're nervous. But then when you're there, she's just a person and you're a person. So that goes away. She was staying, I think, in Luciano Pavarotti's apartment. Oh, I never interviewed him. Oh, he's one that's missing from your long list. Now, one of the challenges, as I intimated in the beginning, is getting the interviewee. I mean, that, that's a huge challenge. And then spending the kind of time that it really takes to know that person. When I interviewed people, I almost knew them better than I knew me. And people would say, I can't believe how much you know about me. Uh -huh. Well, <clears throat> if you're gonna ask these people to take the time, then they deserve to have you know more about them than you know about yourself. Because it's not about yourself. It's about them. And it's about, I loved it because it was giving these people who were up on the stage, oftentimes as somebody else in a role, a chance to talk about who they are. And I think they really loved that. And I, I felt that, that was a gift. They became real. It's like the Tin Woodsman. <laughs> I think maybe Aline Farrell was my most favorite. I drove all the way up to Cassidy, Maine. And at that point, you were using a, a Sony 2 recorder, you know, a cassette, and it wouldn't work. Oh, no. So she and I were on the floor looking for an outlet. We found one. Oh. But she was delightful. And Whenever I was driving through Maine, I would call her up because 
some of that was before you could call anywhere and it didn't cost a whole lot of money. And she'd say, her speaking voice was hilarious. Oh, I'm so glad you called. You, you're the only person who ever calls me who doesn't want anything. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Eileen Farrell, huh? Wow. What That's, a voice. Yeah, and she's also someone who did a lot of crossover, correct? Oh, she did. Yes. Her Cole Porter recordings are smashing. Somehow you have to allow yourself to get into the groove of whomever you're interviewing. Mm. So if it's a more formal person, uh-huh. you're not going to say, oh, I just love being with you. But you could do that with Eileen Farrell. And I think it's very important for the interviewee to feel as if you're on the same wavelength, if you will. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. It's kind of like reading that interpersonal vibe and adjusting to what you're getting. It's kind of what you were saying about really mm-hmm. listening to the other person. And you can tell if somebody has a great sense of humor. And you can go along with that and have a great sense of humor yourself if you, if you do. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's really fun. And it's fun to see if you can get through to the real person who's there. Stephanie Blythe also told me it was the best interview she ever had. And we just played back and forth soul. If you had to boil it down to the top three ingredients of a great interview, what would you say? Be real. Know as much as it's possible to know about the person you're interviewing and have a sense of humor. That also seems like good rules for life and relationships with anyone, right? (laughs) So I love the parallel between being a great interviewer, being a great person, being a great friend. Well, my father always said, the world is full of friends you just haven't met yet. Because I often ended an interview feeling as if I've just made a a new friend. Mm, I love that. But it's very important, as I said, right at the beginning, not to corral them, not to pre-program them, but to let them feel free to talk about themselves and to trust you. Now, why should they trust you? Because you're going to put this interview in a journal that goes around the world. Why should they trust you? Well, somehow your demeanor has to make them feel as if they can, or you don't get a very good interview. Thank you so much for today, Leslie. I really appreciate it. It I learned so much talking to you. Thank you. And I wish you all the best. Thank you.